When people think of St. Francis, they think of him with animals, or perhaps they think of him working with the poor or the lepers. They don't think of St. Francis as a preacher, when in fact he was one of the greatest preachers in history. He not only had large crowds, but it was the effectiveness of his preaching. His sermons were simple. They were on uh, virtue and vice, punishment and glory, pun pointing out that if you follow the path of vice, you'll go to hell. <laughs> you need to convert and change. And he preached on the beauty of virtue and living a virtuous life that one leads to heaven. His incredible sermons were very, very effective, and he knew how to draw a soul to the mercy of God. Hence, 700 years before there was a St. Faustina, St. Francis had the nickname as the Apostle of Mercy because he was able to draw thousands upon thousands to the mercy of God by his very simple preaching. It wasn't his words, it was his life of prayer, his intimacy with God, and the penance that he did for the souls he was about to preach to, that he obtained the grace for them for conversion. So really the power of his preaching didn't lie in his words or the elegance of his argument, it lied in his holiness where he was able to be a true vessel and a true channel of God's grace and mercy. And as a result of his preaching, thousands of unmarried men would leave their lives and become friars. Just gave it up the father. Thousands of unmarried women would go and join the poor Claire nuns. They, as a result, they were moved to give their lives completely to God, or they go to the diocesan priesthood. They were moved to give themselves completely to the Lord and to seek the better part, as St. Paul called it. And uh, this fallacy we have in our day and age today that since the Council, oh, all religious orders always grew slow. That's not true. That's a lie. <laughs> That's a lie by the modernist. Uh, Anthony the Desert went out to the desert the time he let die. There was tens of thousands of people living in the desert, living a monastic life. The St. Benedict's monasteries grew quickly and, and fast. Uh, before St. Francis died, he began with 12. 20 years later, there were 7,000 friars. Maximilian Kolbe's little reform had 300 friars running his newspaper. Um, Bernard of Clairvaux left the monastery after his death with 800 monks in it, not to mention all the other monasteries. So the fallacy that the church grows slow is just that, a fallacy. We can't forget the fact that uh, St. Peter baptized 3,000 people on Pentecost Sunday, right? The church never was growing slow. This is what the modernists like to say to try to, um, de to manage the decline of the church because they don't want to see her grow. They well, go slow, go slow. That's not the way the church has ever worked. She's always worked with great numbers. That's the facts. <laughs> they can argue the facts all they want, but that's a modernist thought. Um, but anyway, not only were... Um, Young men or men who were unmarried joined religious life, and women joined the poor clerics or other religious communities. But the married wanted to follow Christ more radically. They wanted to convert. They wanted to live a life of penance. And so there were many who were asking Francis for how to live in this world and to live in the world in a way that was in keeping with the Holy Gospel, and they could live a life of true repentance and penance and conversion of life. And so he founded his third order. His first order being the friars, his second order being the poor class, the third order being uh, the laity or others who would embrace the rule of life of penance. And um, we see this uh, in 1223 when he wrote his rule for the third order. And this became his order for lay people, or diocesan priests or hermits, who wanted to really observe a gospel life. And among all those who joined the Third Order was many, 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 many who joined the Third Order, and among them were a lot of kings and queens, a lot of people in royalty. And one of them is the saint we celebrate today, who is the patroness of the Third Order, and that is Elizabeth of Hungary. Uh, she was five years old when uh, she was betrothed, was it three years old? She was either three or five years old when St. Elizabeth was betrothed to her husband. <laughs> and so it was an arranged marriage, and so to make sure the arrangement went well and she would grow up with great dignity, her herself being from royal blood, uh, she was sent to go grow up with her with her uh, future husband. And so they were children together, and they truly grew to truly like each other, be good friends. And they were such good friends and true friends because they challenged each other to be holy. 
when they were toddlers, when they were uh, little kids, when they were teenagers, they challenged each other to holiness of life. And so, when the time came for them to be married, they became husband and wife, but they were already dear, good friends, but they were friends in God, which is what made their friendship a true friendship, is that it was based in God. And her husband, he, he loved Elizabeth, and Elizabeth had this heart for the poor, and he was more than happy to let her do her thing for the poor. And he gave her whatever she wanted, and she had full use of all the royal finances, and now as king, to do whatever she wanted with. So now as the Queen of Hungary, uh, she built hospitals, she built shelters, she built convents and monasteries. Uh, she herself every morning would go and take care of the sick and the poor. She was so beautiful in how she cared for them. And uh, his family didn't like that because she was spending a lot of the fortune of the kingdom on the poor. And they would get a little upset that he, she was, you know, uh, taking so much money. From the accounts, she even went to the point of taking all of her royal jewelry, all of her wealthy clothes, and selling it so she can take care of the poor. I mean, she could care less for the royalties. That didn't matter to her at all. She saw the riches of the kingdom were the poor. That was the wealth of the church, much like St. Lawrence the Deacon had said when he was brought before the king, uh, the, the emperor, and told to bring the riches of the church, and he brought all the poor with him. <laughs> that was Elizabeth's mentality. One day her husband uh, came home and uh, all the other relatives were like, you know what she did? She has a boy with leprosy in your bed. You're going to wind up getting leprosy. And in fact, she had brought home a leprous boy that no one would take care of and she put him in the royal bed to care for this little boy. And the king came in a little upset and he pulled back the sheets. He saw Christ crucified lying in their bed. And he said to her, feel free. Any time you wish to bring Christ to our home. Right? These are the beautiful stories of him. One day he was out and she was bringing food to the poor. And he kind of jokingly stopped her in the street. was kind of teasing her like, where are you going? What do you have? And uh, she opened her garment. It was full of roses. And he just was so pleased to see how beautiful his wife was. And unfortunately, he, with the campaign, uh, that he went uh, to the Holy Lands and uh, he died on the way. And... The family took the opportunity at his death to throw her out of the kingdom. His brother took over as king. She was thrown out and onto the streets with the three kids. She was just in her early 20s. And she's homeless now. And she finds herself, no one would take her in because they were afraid because of the king, the new king and so forth. And so she was destitute on the street begging for food and she was perfectly happy. Because now she could truly be conformed to Christ crucified. She found herself and her children living in a stable. And she was so pleased to have shared in the sufferings of Christ, to share in the poverty of Christ. Um, her confessor even writes about this, uh, how she was so pleased to have embraced the poverty of our Lord. Even when her children were restored to their royalty, and she remained on the streets, she remained in poverty. She preferred poverty to the royal house. She wanted to be poor among the poor with Christ. She died at a very early age, I believe, of 24 years old. Young girl, young woman, leaving her children and being restored to their kingship and so forth. And the royal line continued, the Bob Hofsburg dynasty continued through her, uh, her children and grandchildren. What an amazing woman who lived such an amazing life who gave everything to the Lord. People say, oh, the church never focused on married saints in the past. Bulldinky. The church spoke a lot about uh, married saints. Most of them belong to the third order of, of, of St. Francis. They belong to other second, third orders. But there are lots of married saints. She being preeminent among them as the patroness of the third order. This married woman who truly cared and loved her husband and truly cared and loved the poor. As a widower, she, widow, she gave everything to the Lord. Uh, and she held back nothing. Such a beautiful, beautiful holy saint. Um, and we celebrate her today. Uh, we ask her powerful intercession that we ourselves be given that grace of true charity uh, for those in need. But more than that, that we be given a true charity for our Lord and love for our Lord. All of her works that she did was not about her works. It came out of her love for Christ. Right? She did it because she was first and foremost in love with God. 
many people, priests, diocesan priests, all witnessed her coming out of prayer and not only light emanating from her face, but light shooting from her eyes that were as blinding as the sun that they talked about when she would finish prayer. So close she was to God that her face would radiate the light of God and literally light would come forth from her eyes to the point where it was blinding after she had finished prayer. Uh, it's a particular gift that is given to certain saints. So we ask for powerful intercession that through her intercession we may receive the grace of charity for our neighbor in caring for those in need, but charity for God as well, to truly love the Lord our God. We have become so much intimate lovers of God that we become true vessels of His grace, true vessels of His love, true vessels of His great and incredible mercy. May the Saint Elizabeth intercede for us today, and particularly for all members of our Third Order, that they may follow her beautiful and holy example of life. May God bless you. I'm Mary